We'll pass now to the next presentation. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Rainer Adelung from Kiel University, Germany. Uh, Professor Adelung, are you online? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Yeah, please, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for this invitation. And I'm very sad not to be there in Chisinau. Um, I would uh, congratulate Professor Shonta and uh, express my uh, thank to this long uh, collaboration. If I'm not mistaken, I think I'm also since 2011 continuously on all this nice um, ICNBME conferences, which brings together nanotechnology and biomedical engineering. So, um, yeah, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, in order to save uh, uh, time, I think I start now um, right away. Well, the title is um, yeah, about negligible mass of uh, graphene, which is applied for repeatable air explosions and instant sterilization. So something between nanotechnology and biomedical engineering. Well, um, yeah, here a very brief outline. Uh, so um, first it's about how to build an aero material, which is the basis of this explosions. And I uh, would like to talk a little bit about the unique properties of aero materials. And then I would like to come to the um, properties and applications of materials which have almost no heat capacity. So um, where I'm coming from is Kiel. Kiel is uh, in the north of Germany. Uh, so we are located here uh, close to this shipyard, uh, which is manufacturing, for example, fuel cell driven submarines. Um, I'm very sad, as I said, that I cannot make the uh, way here from Kiel to uh, Chisinau, but uh, now you have also an idea where at the Baltic Sea Kiel is located. Well, um, what is the basis of these aero materials um, I, I will talk about? The basis is the material zinc oxide, which you can see as a ceramics, as a 2,6 semiconductor. So, um, yeah, uh, it is shown here how the atomic structure is. So you have layers of zinc and layers of oxygen uh, arranged in a versite uh, uh, structure. Uh, it's a white band gap semiconductor. I do not want to repeat all these properties. Um, however, it's also considered as a biomaterial, which might be interesting in this conference as well. And you can utilize this as a nanomaterial very well because uh, shaping it in various forms is easy with the zinc oxide. This is because if you're growing zinc oxide, then uh, these C axis you see here in this crystal structure is growing very rapidly. As soon as you form a layer of zinc, immediately oxygen, if it's around, will uh, settle down on that uh, due to the high polarity and then zinc comes and so on. So it basically shoots out in the C axis. And uh, if we do similar like Professor Mimura was showing, um, very nicely in his um, um, talk, um, the uh, uh, catalyst particles of gold can be, for example, placed on a zinc grain. If you heat the whole thing in an oven, then you get the growth, in this case, not of carbon, but of zinc. And you can see here that this zinc grows in very thin wire types of structures. They're single crystalline, but Due to the nanoscale, they are very flexible because they are very thin. So like glass fibers, which you can easily bend. And we employed this method since now over 10 years, so approximately 15 years, uh, to grow various structures, mainly structures where you have tetrapods. So like this structure you see here in the camera in this, in this model, forming then uh, materials which grow together uh, on the macroscopic size. You see here, it's, uh, for example, scale of 100 micrometers, 0.1 millimeters, and it forms uh, a three-dimensional construct out of these tetrapods. If we zoom in, and depending on the growth conditions, these tetrapods, where uh, here these arm diameters are, uh, yeah, starting from micrometers, going all the way down to the nanoscales, are interconnecting the individual 
um, um, tetrapods and give it a very flexible network. So this uh, diameter is 50 to 100 nanometers, for example. Um, however, to um, yeah, even though we uh, do research on that for now almost 15 years, still um, it's of high interest and we can use these uh, fascinating properties of the material quite a lot. So uh, from uh, last year cover stories, there's a nice mixture between nanotechnology and biomedical um, applications. So uh, for example, um, as this year a story came out where we use these tetrapods in wound patches for antiseptic properties and for targeted protein relief. However, today I would like to talk more about the physical properties, which can be applied for healthcare as well uh, as they're um, now just published in the current cover story of uh, materials today issue. So uh, behind that uh, zinc oxide is uh, Yogendra Kuma Mishra. He's now professor in Denmark, but he was uh, over 10 years uh, doing performing his habilitation in my group here in Kiel. So um, if you're interested in zinc oxide and the properties, I can recommend his review article from 2018 about tetrapodal zinc oxide. However, how is the growth uh, um, um, occurring? So uh, you can see here a view in the oven how we grow this zinc oxide networks, these tetrapodal networks. It's fairly simple. You have inside here a crucible where you put in some zinc grains plus a polymer, which you can just decompose. Uh, uh, could be any polymer which is um, um, attracted to oxygen and burns at the same time. So we call it sacrificial polymer. This is controlling the um, oxygen depletion inside of the oven. And then um, at the same time, the zinc is molten, evaporated, and can participate. And if you look the oven, depending on the growth conditions, you get even larger crystals or smaller crystals, these uh, tetrapodal layers. On the large scale, our startup company, Phystone, is um, um, uh, uh, working on that. As you can see, here's a ruler sticking in this material. It's really mass producing. So in order to give a, a kind of more uh, distinct shape and uh, control the properties, you can take this tetrapodal powder, which is loosely held together. You can compress it a little bit. And in this way, you can uh, make templates for sintering it in various shapes. So after the sintering, you see that also some tetrapod arms are here sintered together as interconnects. And in this way, you can have a lot of different shapes, for example, ring shape or uh, some um, um, rods, uh, for example, for tensile tests and so on. So you're very flexible in dealing with this material. However, for this talk, this material is again only a sacrificial template. So if you take the structure and if you would look inside, you would see all these tetrapods on the micro scale. And um, it's yeah, almost 10 years ago uh, when we were working with uh, Professor Karl Schulte from the uh, Technical University of Hamburg uh, together and Matthias Mecklenburg, they have found a process uh, where uh, similar like carbon nanotube grows, you can grow uh, graphite structure on this zinc oxide in a CVD reactor. By adding hydrogen, you're reducing the surface of the zinc oxide and at elevated um, temperatures, you have then molten zinc on the surface. And this is a nice catalyst for uh, carbon precursors and growth of graphene layers is occurring and forming then uh, nanoscopic uh, arm diameters. Here you see the synthesis, which is stopped right in the middle of the process. So you see still here some zinc oxide sticking in there, but also some hollow tetrapod arms already. And finally, you have then a construct which is entirely consisting out of um, hollow uh, nanoscopic vault uh, um, graphite or graphene um, um, tetrapods. The macroscopic uh, view on this is entirely black. If you imagine that light comes in, uh, some is absorbed on this nanoscale graphene, others is scattered, but it will never come back uh, to the eye or to the light source, so it's an entirely black material. It's hydrophobic, but its re most remarkable structure, uh, uh, structural property 
is its high porosity or ultra light weight. So if you have a cubic centimeter out of this material, and if you place it in yeah, air, air is all around, is going through this, it has a lot of free space where air goes in. The air would uh, have a weight of one gram per cubic centimeter. So you're adding to this weight only 0.18 milligram per cubic centimeter in the most ideal case. So basically, you are comparable with the density of this aero material um, of the ambient air. And it translates to 99.991% porosity in this case. So meaning that the material is really almost not there. However, you see it can absorb light uh, and it is um, a conductive material. So uh, some immediate properties can be illustrated here. Here you see how this aero material is compressed. It's black in between here, uh, uh, these two plates. It's compressed down. And now uh, the arm is moved up again, and you see it unfolds itself, which uh, points uh, um, to a certain robustness. And uh, you can see here, if you do an electrostatic experiment, uh, you see how fast it can bounce up and down without being destroyed. So here, this experiment is based on um, static electricity. So you have some um, electrons. Uh, um, uh, here charged up on this uh, polymer stick and now it's attracting this uh, conductive material and it bounces around till it has lost all this um, um, charges which are applied here. So it's polarizable in this way as well. And uh, robust, I would say, black and you can heat it, for example, in vacuum or in air. Uh, in vacuum, you can heat it uh, uh, up to a couple of thousand degrees C. So what's the secret of this robustness? Well, we revealed this with Nicola Pugno and uh, yeah, um, Donald Arts uh, here on, on, on this uh, um, nice um, atomic force microscope instrument inside of an SEM. You see here how this tip is now pressing to an arm. This arm is folded and you can see it here in this magnification, I hope you can see my, my pointer um, where the circle is around. So it folds down, but it comes back after uh, releasing the force. So here in this macroscopic model, the same is going to occur. So you have an instability that it's buckling, but it's snapping back to its place. And uh, this was revealed here uh, by um, simulations and understanding and concepts of Nicola Pugno. So, uh, yeah, mm, last time uh, when uh, we could have a nice uh, uh, conference um, in Moldova, I presented you some optical properties, which are uh, basically uh, originating from the hierarchy of the material. So beside uh, graphene, you can, for example, depositing boron nitride on the surface, and then instead of a black material, you uh, get uh, some uh, transparent uh, material, which is um, yeah, uh, scattering the light. And uh, you can see it here in a magnification. Uh, the trick of the scattering is that you can apply it even to scatter laser light. So if you come with a red, green, and blue laser, all this adds up then to white light. And uh, what's behind this light scattering? Well, it's um, Kind of illustrated here. If you scatter the light on this um, arrow boron nitride material, uh, if uh, it's reflected on such a wall or scattered on such a wall, which is at least on the nanoscale a quantum mechanical phenomena, um, it follows a kind of random pathway through the material and uh, takes long time till it comes out. If it's a little bit uh, a different way, the photon is uh, scattered then it comes to a completely different target. And in this way, even the speckle pattern of the laser is reduced and is not, not there. And you can tune this diffusion. And uh, yeah, this was a very nice uh, meeting last time. And uh, yeah, then um, it started um, to continue on other uh, topics, which are um, uh, yeah, speciality of Moldova, which is aero gallium nitride. Um, 
Ion Teganyanu is, is, is performing since long time in his group and nicely with Boris and, and Ion, uh, we had a publication, for example, on uh, terahertz shielding so that you're employing these materials also on a completely different wavelength. So with CVD and these templates, you can do a lot of stuff. And if you're interested in this to apply your CVD method, maybe on this type of templates, I'm very happy to provide some if you wish. Another way without CVD uh, to uh, yeah, put nano materials into these templates and removing the templates is a wet chemical approach. So in the graphene flagship, as illustrated here in this movie, you can drop in some graphene suspensions, which are soaked up here by this zinc oxide network. And this uh, graphene nicely folds around the uh, individual tetrapods. And if you're etching away the tetrapods at the end, you're ending up again with a network of tetrapods uh, interconnecting and uh, extreme uh, thin uh, graphene uh, uh, walls um, of these um, um, uh, tetrapods are resembled um, by the graphene. And you can see it here by removing one arm that it's hollow inside and you have uh, a very nanoscopic wall thickness. While the arm diameter is something like between two and three nanometers. So, and what's remarkable about this? Well, we have a uh, very low uh, weight and uh, this means that we have very low heat capacity. I can use this maybe as a board just to illustrate it. The heat energy you're adding, delta Q, is related to the temperature. So we have the heat capacity times delta T. Oops, sorry. I'm drawing here with a mouse, so this is a T. Um, so um, uh, um, basically, it's proportional. And this heat capacity uh, is based on the specific heat capacity times the mass of the material. So the specific heat capacity is, of course, a constant. And the mass is extremely lightweight, meaning that if you're adding a little um, energy, the temperature goes up dramatically because if you see then that delta T, cancel again, delta T, oops, delta T, is the heat contribution delta Q divided by specific heat uh, uh, capacity times the mass of the material. And if the mass is close to zero, you have a very high temperature with very low energy. And this is what uh, we, we employed. And uh, the first uh, hints that this could, could work uh, were in a collaboration with uh, Jan Schäfer from the uh, ENP in Greifswald, I was telling him, well, our material is almost perfect black body. And then he said, okay, if this is the case, that's fine, because then we can have here a plasma torch and we can have the aerographite and go on with the um, infrared camera and see a mirror image of this torch here in the, in the aerographine, aerographite material. You can see here a movie where you see with the infrared camera the heating of this of this flame because immediately it gets warm by the infrared radiation, but there is a kind of no heat conductivity in the material. You've seen it; it's extremely lightweight and consisting out of all these tubes, barely interconnected, and so therefore the heat conductivity is very uh, low. So that's very um, um, interesting um, for for that. So, um, yeah, um, yeah, and uh, there's another possibility, and that's what uh, I want to talk about in the last 10 minutes, which is that you can also actively heat the material. So uh, this is uh, uh, basically done by Dr. Schütt and Dr. Rasch. They're the first authors of this uh, um, uh, currently uh, published uh, materials today uh, 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 paper. 
And it's basically, as you see here, I hope you can, you can see my pointer. Um, uh, on the left, uh, you put some power to this network. Inside these blue dots should be, for example, the nitrogen molecules from the ambient atmosphere um, um, uh, being inside of this uh, aero material. Now, if you do a joule heating with a very short pulse, for example, one millisecond, the whole temperature shoots up immediately. For example, you stop at 400 degrees C, but at the same time, also the air inside gets warm. So the heat transfer is very fast because it's almost the same heat uh, um, um, capacity of both materials. And if air gets hot, it expands. So it shoots out, so like an explosion. And it's immediately cooling. So even in a couple of hundred milliseconds, it's cooled down to 20 degrees C uh, later on. So, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, artist animation, which is totally ridiculous. So uh, this is not probably how a uh, nitrogen molecule looks, uh, looks like, but it should just illustrate the air shoots out and the whole stuff gets cold again. So we have seen this is because of the structure. So you have uh, yeah, the tubes, which have a microscopic diameter, but only nanoscopic walls from, from graphene. So uh, they are forming this um, arrow material, the structure with a lot of free space. So there's almost no hindrance of the air shooting out after this heating. And uh, this is illustrated here, if you do it periodically, um, in a thermodynamic manner. So you have your first state where you have not applied any uh, current. Then you have an isochronic heating by um, heating the aero material. This heat is transferred then uh, almost immediately in uh, milliseconds uh, to the um, gas. And then we follow an adiabatic expansion. So immediately without energy transfer, uh, further energy transfer, the air is a kind of shooting out. And then if you switch off uh, your power, then the whole thing gets cooled down and uh, you get to the initial state again. You can see here these power pulses and this, at the same time uh, with a, a heat uh, infrared sensor, see how the temperature shoots up within milliseconds and a couple of hundred milliseconds it takes to cool down again in a periodic manner. And that works for quite a while. So here you see cycle one, here you see cycle 100,000, there's almost no change. So this explosion, air explosion can be done in a continuous uh, manner. So you see here's the number of cycles and you see the maximum temperature. It even gets a little bit better because maybe you're inside uh, burning away some material and it gets slightly more lightweight and in this way it gets to higher uh, temperature. So this is in this case reduced graphene oxide, but you can do it with all kinds of materials, even with carbon nanotubes, which you can fold around the tank. Okay, so here's a detailed examination. Uh, why is it working with this type of aero materials and not, for example, with aero gels? Well, the aero gel is too tight it has too much um, um, uh, smaller structures and it has not this free volume, this large free volume. So that is, uh, this is, this is uh, um, uh, uh, therefore uh, cooling off on a much larger time scale. So almost the cooling time constant is a factor of 10 higher as well as the heating time constant. And you can see this also if you do not etch away the zinc oxide inside of the material, if you go now to the lower view graph, I hope you can see, see my pointer. Uh, so if it's a hollow material, then you see it cools much faster than if it's filled still with the zinc oxide. It takes almost a second till it cools down here from 400 to 150 or 120 degrees. Well, if you have, uh, yeah, here's a comparison in the internal structure between an aerogel and the aero material. So our aero material, which has this uh, hierarchical structure and therefore here on the micro scale, the free volume is uh, uh, useful then for the very fast um, heating and cooling. And you can apply the whole thing now in such a manner that you place here inside of a syringe, which is filled with liquid nitrogen, this aero material. These aero materials are extremely lightweight materials. So uh, the whole thing here 
just has a weight of one milligram. But if you're putting now power pulses to this, you can now, and as you see here in the magnification, you can move up by the air expansion, this, this syringe, this uh, uh, is, is, is moving up against gravity. And in order to play this a little bit harder, you're taking now two kilograms and put this on onto this one milligram material. And you see this actuator doesn't care. It's still um, pushing up uh, the piston here of the syringe and uh, moving this one uh, milligram or less is two kilograms upwards. Uh, so this is a nice actuator, which can be used. It's, it's, it's very lightweight. And if you see this now in a diagram, for example, comparing it with other materials, then you see this electrical powered repeatable air explosion is advantageous in terms of strain and gravimetric power density. You can use it also for biomaterials applications. So here, this, for example, is a latex membrane, which is just uh, underneath equipped with such an aero material, which will then uh, be pumped here in a manner that it's kind of moved up and down this, this membrane. However, for soft robotics, for example, could have application. You can build a lot of stuff, uh, water pumps, micro uh, uh, thrusters, and so on. Uh, from this, there are a, a lot of ideas uh, how you can employ the stuff. For example, in a micro pump, you use this here at different frequencies, like a stepper pump to push in the air here with two check valves uh, and such a scenario to move forward some fluids. For example, for microfluidics, it can be useful. Other applications I uh, uh, um, can show you are here thrusters, where out of the syringe, uh, this hot air is uh, uh, peri periodically uh, moved outward. And at the end, I don't know if you can hear it, you can make also an air headphone, because if you're coming with um with uh the uh yeah heated air in a periodic manner you have basically a loudspeaker yeah uh lots of applications uh, uh you can do i think i'm running here out of time so um um yeah the final one i only want to uh, present you is that you if you have heating rates more than half a million of kelvin uh, finally it was uh, 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 possible for Fabian Schutt to, to blow the material up. But if you stay below um, half a million of uh, degrees per second heating rate, the material is robust. Finally, you can use this, for example, for filtering properties where you have an air filter and uh, this air filter is mounted, for example, in an aeroplane, a current spearhead we do, then you can disinfect within milliseconds. I would like to thank you all and uh, uh, especially my very active group, which is responsible for all that. And uh, I think we run out of time. So if there are questions, uh, please write me an email or if we have still a minute, then please uh, um, uh, place them now. I want to thank you very much uh, for the organizers to invite me again to this exciting conference. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Adelung, uh, for this very, very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, well, uh, are there any questions to Professor Adelung? Uh, I would like to ask you, well, since your group has experience in uh, this issue, uh, well, uh, how uh, small could be the zinc oxide tetrapods? I mean, uh, can we want to reach uh, the size is the length of tetrapods of just a few tens of nanometers. In principle, it is known that you can make also much smaller nan uh, uh, nanostructures in such a way. Then you have to go up with the heat. Uh, we found this microscale quite interesting because you utilizing as a, as a template. However, if you want to make your actuators smaller, that might be a good pathway. And I remember that you have also the setup where you can do this in, in, in the CVD. So we could think, for example, together to take this smaller zinc oxide tetrapods and build then a nanoscale actuator in such a manner, or at least actuators, whatever, with the dimensions of a cubic uh, micrometer. That could be some fun because still, if you heat this up, 
you would gain, for example, at 400, 500 degrees, another cubic micrometer of actuation uh, uh, air volume. Yeah, thank you, uh, Professor DeLung. Uh, and uh, well, I hope that we will uh, meet uh, soon uh, in real uh, space. And uh, we wish you good health and uh, success. And uh, of course, uh, we hope for a, a fruitful uh, collaboration in the future. Uh, we, we have long standing experience in this. See you. Thank you very much. Uh, Vladimir, you had a question? Yes, I had a question, and I send this question to all. If you look now in your chat, you will see it. Thank you. Then I will answer it as it's good tradition in coffee breaks. Yes, great. <laughs> and I have also some coffee. Cheers. Great, great. Thank you. Uh, enjoy it. <laughs> In fact, it's about uh, electric properties, thermal power, and uh, uh, thermoelectric properties. Are these materials uh, perspective for eventual applications as thermoelectric materials? Because they might reveal really extreme, extreme properties in this sense. Yeah, that is very interesting. Very good question. We tried this already with some thermoelectrics, uh, but probably we hadn't the right material. So if you have a nice uh, thermoelectric, we can try to, for example, in a CVD process to coat it on the zinc oxide tetrapods and uh, getting therefore a quite good insulation um, yes. at the same time and heating it. We were not too successful in trying this, but maybe we haven't tried hard enough or didn't have the right material. So if, if uh, yeah, you have there some ideas or interest, would yeah. be happy to subsequently discuss it with you. Yeah. Yes, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Rainer. Uh, in my opinion, because you have extreme um, um, properties in what concerns uh, uh, thermal uh, response, uh, you made equally uh, control the uh, thermoelectric effect or, or electric properties. And in any case, whether it will be enhanced or reduced, it might be of uh, great interest for application. Yeah, thank you very much. It's a no, good no, suggestion. I am impressed by your presentation, which is at the same time inspired and inspiring. Thank you very much. Good.